Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm Ted Swedenberg of the University of Arkansas, here to welcome you to today's event on CC's Many Jails from Gaza to Torah. Before we begin, let me say how pleased we are to thank the good organizations which have co-sponsored this event, including MARIP, the Middle East Research and Information Project, Internationalism from Below, Dawn, or Democracy for the Arab World Now, and finally, the generous folks at Haymarket Books, whose hard work and dedication has made this event possible. Thank you, and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. This panel was organized by the U.S. Committee to End Political Repression in Egypt. The committee is made up of a group of U.S.-based activists, scholars, and researchers, all of us alarmed by the increasing and horrific levels of political repression in Egypt and by the fact that U.S. dollars go a long way to enabling that repression. We're a relatively new organization. We have, among other things, organized our first webinar in March entitled Repression and Political Prisoners in Egypt from Tahrir Square to Torah Prison and recruited U.S. academics to sign a letter sent to members of Congress on tax day, urging the suspension of U.S. military aid to Egypt. Please check out our website and follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and I think those are, you can see those in the comments. Um, and for more information and to get involved, please email us at mahrusasolidarity at gmail.com, and that'll be in the, um, in, the, in the notes as well. Americans may not think of Egypt very often but they should. Egypt is the second largest recipient of American military financing at $1.3 billion per year or $3.5 million per day. Since 1978, we've sent Egypt's dictators over $51 billion of military aid, a huge sum of money to be sending to kleptocratic generals. Only Israel receives more U.S. aid than Egypt. This is no coincidence. Ever since the signing of the 1978 Camp David Accords, Egypt has been a key player in U.S. policy on Palestine-Israel. If the Gaza Strip, as many have noted, is an open-air prison, then Egypt is one of the two primary jailers of its two million inhabitants, performing a central role in maintaining the long-standing blockade of Gaza imposed back in 2007. Recent events in Palestine, Israel, have given the Sisi regime new political leverage. Egypt is widely praised by the U.S. administration for its role in brokering the Gaza ceasefire, and President Biden has recommended another $1.3 billion in military aid to Egypt without the imposition of any human rights conditions. This after Biden pledged during his presidential campaign that there were to be no more blank checks for Trump's favorite dictator. This, when U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken stated in March that the Biden-Harris administration will stand against human rights abuses wherever they occur, regardless of whether the perpetrators are adversaries or partners. Once again, Egypt's perceived importance to U.S. regional strategies allows President Sisi, in power since the military coup of 2013, free reign to rule as he sees fit, employing levels of repression perhaps never before seen in Egypt's modern history. All the while, dollars, dollars excuse me, and weapons from the U.S. pour into the country without interruption. Human rights organizations estimate the current number of political prisoners in Egypt to be around 70,000, although some think the true number is 100,000. Anyone whose speech, writing, or behavior expresses the slightest criticism or deviation from the state's official line or official social mores is threatened with being locked up. Prisoners of conscience are regularly disappeared, locked in solitary confinement, held for months and even years without trial, and denied access to food, health care, and family visits. Torture is widespread and routine. But no word of criticism of Egypt from Secretary of State Blinken, who just a few days ago declared that the U.S. will not waver in our commitment to condemn and eliminate torture. And the regime is now on an execution spree, putting some 51 men and women to death in the first half of the year and confirming with no possibility of appeal the death sentences of 12 men 
who participated in the Rabah Square sit-in in 2013. None of this represents the values of U.S. citizens, nor does it serve any interests save those of the petroleum and arms corporations, not the jailing of 70,000 Egyptian political prisoners, nor the blockade on the two million people in the Gaza Strip. Without U.S. support, guns, and dollars, this state of affairs could not continue. It does not have to be this way, and U.S. citizens should not have to pay for it. These are the things that the U.S. Committee to end political repression in Egypt believes in and will be working towards in the coming months, and we look forward to seeing you at other events. Today, we have three distinguished speakers on our panel. Going first will be Yasmin Amar, human rights lawyer and Egypt legal associate at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Up second, Omar Shakir, Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch. Prior to his work with HRW, he was a Bertha fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he focused on US counterterrorism policies, including legal, legal representation of Guantanamo detainees. And finally, Ra'ad Jarrar, Arab American activist and the advocacy director of Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now, the organization founded by the late Jamal Khashoggi. After each speaker has had an opportunity to make their presentation, we will have a broader conversation among the panelists, followed by a question and answer period. If you have questions for our panelists, please put them into the comments and we will do our best to reply to them and you can start posing questions at any time. Yasmin. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you for the opportunity to join such a brilliant and wonderful panel for a vital discussion and very timely. Uh, uh, I think you said everything in your in your uh, presentation, but I'll try to break it down and say why is Egypt is actual uh, uh, huge jail for all of, of its citizens. Um, well, using prison and detention as a tool to guarantee silence has started when Sisi came to power uh, 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 after after ousting Mohamed Morsi. And since then, we've been seeing that state security authorities, all uh, 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 involved judiciary, has been inventing and furthering tools to ensure keeping uh, um, activists, lawyers, journalists, human rights defenders in prison for as long as possible. Detention, uh, uh, prolonged detention, lack of due process, and even recently using COVID to further these oppressive practices are just a part of a whole process of silencing Egyptians to retain, to, to keep, to keep uh, stability over freedom of, of expression and over democracy. Well, uh, uh, recently, most we, we know about torture, we know about uh, fake charges, we know about controversial legislation such as counterterrorism laws, some, such as uh, terrorist entities law and other provisions within the penal code. However, we don't really understand how this process goes. What are these new practices that manage to keep people in prison indefinitely? One of these practices that has been recently developed by state security authority and the state security prosecution was complicit to is rotation or tadweer. When political activists get arrested, the maximum pretrial detention limit in the, uh, the Egyptian code of criminal procedure is just two years. But to circumvent this limit and to keep those, deta those detainees in prison for as long as possible, we'd find that when the time has come and the two years has passed, or when a court issues a release order for a certain detainees, the state security prosecution, the state security authority creates a new false case and fabricate even similar charges, alleging that in some cases that those detainees committed crimes from within their cells, even if they are in solitary confinement in most cases. And we would see that lawyers would submit their defense, did, does everything they can. However, state security prosecution would end up in ordering a new 
pre-trial detention uh, uh, duration that starts from zero. And now we have political activists, lawyers, and journalists who are in prison, um, in pre-trial detention for over, for more than three cases and four cases, and it's going to continue because there hasn't been any uh, ways to, to resist this. Other than just rotation, we would find that people not just being placed on a new cases when their time is up to, to be released or when the court issues a release order, we'd find that state security prosecution continue to create more cases to burden lawyers and slow their, mo their, their moves in defending their, their clients, to burden the, the activists' families and make them unable to support them eventually. And this is all a process to break the opposition in Egypt. We know that there are torture in Egyptian pr prison, but not just torture in the classic way that we know. Contributes to this also practices and prison conditions that are inhumane and horrible. Putting 80 detainees in a cell that, that only con can only contain 20 is mounts to torture under international law. Contributes to this, as I mentioned, practices that are done by prison administration itself not just applying the prison regulation in a way that further this torture, but also creating new ways to break those detainees. For example, we find that in holidays, uh, uh, the prison shuts down and everybody goes on a vacation, but they lock down the cells on the detainees, not allowing them to get out for four or five days. This number of people staying in one room for this amount of time mounts to torture. Cutting off drinking water off of the cells to punish prisoners mounts to torture. Denying essential need, essential health needs, health care mounts to torture. So we see that filling up prisons was not even enough for CC's government. However, Egypt has been turned to a huge jail by other practices that happens outside of the prison. We would find that on memorials of the revolution, for example, police officers stops people on the streets and searching their phones. A picture or a text could lead to prison. Any expression of opinion on social media that is supposed to be a free virtual space could lead to prison. And not only that, we have thousands of Egyptian people who are under travel bans, arbitrary travel bans, without legal basis. And this all created Egypt to a huge jail that eventually led Sisi to make a huge gain on the front of foreign policy. We know that Maybe some people don't know that Egypt has arrested Rami Shaf, the member of the PDS movement, and he has actually established and founded the Egypt branch to the PDS movement that works to uh, uh, resist the occupation in Palestine. Arresting Rami Shaf and keeping him in prison ensured that in regards to the front of the Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestinian case, Sisi would have a single voice in this region without any inter interrupts being interrupted by the, the, the resistant movements, by even Egyptian activists who historically supported the Palestinian case. Using the same tools of oppression that he uses against his people, Sisi was able to make gain to make the, the recent gain with the US confirming good relationships and confirming that he is the only actor that can deal with this case. Previously also, this is not the first time that Sisi did this. In, 20, in 2015, Hamas was listed as a terrorist entity. And then after Sisi forced them to deny the Muslim Brotherhood, he eventually left them of the terrorist entity list so they would so they would be, would be had have access to egypt still in conversation manipulating all powers all sorts of of resistance using the tools of prison and detention has been very successful for the egyptian uh, government however the price has been crucial for all the the the, the, democ the the democratic movement for all the rights movement in egypt and we see that it does not involve egyptians also there are american citizens 
scientists in Egypt who are facing the same fate for even for just being researchers, academics. We have American citizens who died under the Egyptian in the Egyptian cruel prisons, and we haven't seen accountability yet. So after giving all this this context, I believe that we need to really address the reason behind all CC's success, which is using arbitrary and oppressive uh, uh, methods to achieve the success. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, I wanted to add just a parenthetical note, which is that BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment um, and Sanctions. Probably everybody knows that, but there may be one or two of you who don't know. Um, and uh, next up, Omar Shaker. Thank you so much, Ted, and really just echoing my thanks to the organizers. I think making the linkage between the situation in Gaza and political repression in Egypt um, is intuitive for some of us, but that's not uh, enough the focus in sort of the mainstream conversation, but pillars of, uh, for oppression to further cement uh, the open air prison that is Gaza and contribute to a policy that's a part of the apartheid that the Israeli government imposes, um, you know, on Palestinians, including those, um, you know, as familiar with the situation there. Of course, Gaza is a part of the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, it's been under Israeli occupation since 1967. Although the Israeli ground forces and settler population withdrew from Gaza in 2005, the Israeli government has re retained control, primary control over Gaza in the 16 years since through a variety of different tools. Um, it includes their control in large part over the movement of people and goods. We'll get to Egypt later, but just sort of putting the Rafah crossing aside, the remaining crossings um, in Gaza, in addition to movement between Gaza in the West Bank, which is one territorial entity under international law, which Israel has recognized. In addition, control over the airspace, the access to the sea, uh, control over the population registry, which is the um, institution that controls the issuance of ID, which is what you need to travel. Uh, in addition to control over resources, infrastructure, including the electricity lines, the phone lines, the uh, internet cable connections. Um, uh, beyond that, the VAT uh, collection, tax collection. So you look at all these things together and you see that Israel, um, because of that control, is considered to still be the occupying power by the international community, by the UN, um, you know, by the Red Cross. And one of the main measures or mechanisms of control that the Israeli government has exercised has been a closure policy. Um, so since 2007 in particular, the Israeli government has imposed a generalized ban on the travel into and outside of Gaza. This means that nobody can go in and nobody can go out outside of narrow humanitarian exemptions. Um, so basically you have to fit within a list of criteria needing a life uh, urgent life-saving uh, medical procedure, you know, a, a close relative of, of visiting and to get a permit from the relevant authorities to be able to leave via Israel's border crossing. Travel out, outside of Gaza, you know, even before the COVID pandemic was just a fraction, one to two percent of what it was, you know, before in, in 2000, much less in 2007. Um, the Israeli government also sharply restricts the entry and exit of goods which has a significant effect on the economy, not only you know, what's available in country, which Israel sharply uh, limits, for example, limiting goods they consider to be dual use, um, you know, which could be used, they say, for military purposes, like building material, but also is essential for everyday life. In addition, the goods that can go out, um, and that has a major effect on the economy of Gaza because that's sort of one of the main sources uh, you know, of income for the local population in the entire private sector. These policies have really crippled the economy in Gaza, right? Um, you have 80% of the population, according to UN data, that relies on humanitarian aid. GDP per capita has gone down since the early 1990s. Uh, and you have the majority of the population that spends the majority of their day without electricity. Um, and these policies are among those that led Human Rights Watch in April to find that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians, including those uh, that live in the Gaza Strip. 
So where does Egypt fit into this picture? Egypt fits into this picture because the other crossing for Gaza, besides those maintained, you know, by the Israeli government, are maintained, you know, by Egypt. And the Egyptian government, since the military coup of 2013, has effectively um, largely sealed those borders, um, especially between 2013 and 2018. Of course, there were restrictions that existed before um, under the Mubarak you know, government. Uh, there were some restrictions even under the Morsi government, but that policy dramatically shifted after the military coup. And among the reasons for that, and Yasmin briefly addressed this, was sort of this idea that Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood um, are tied together, that there was some sort of um, collaboration, conspiracy theories, you know, abound. But the bottom line here is Gaza has largely been also sealed on the Egyptian side. Egypt and Israel closely uh, collaborate. So even those people that are allowed to travel into and out of Gaza, you know, there is coordination with the Israeli authority in terms of um, how that process operates. Um, even where people in Gaza are allowed to travel. Right. You know, where the borders open, where they're able to get security permission from the Egyptian authorities, from the local Gaza authorities. Uh, Human Rights Watch has documented awful stories of Palestinians from Gaza who are mistreated um, at the Rafah crossing or, you know, take days to arrive to Cairo airport who get stuck for days, hours, days, weeks even um, at the Cairo airport who face also mistreatment on their way back. Uh, who, who are stuck and aren't able to, in some cases, make it back to Gaza or to arrive for urgent medical procedures. And again, these are these are uh, anecdotes we've documented. I should note that Egypt has opened the border more since the Great March of Return in 2018. But again, with COVID, a lot of those restrictions returned. So there has been an opening relative to what it was between 2013 and 2018, but it still remains largely sealed. Egypt largely justifies these restrictions on two bases. One is it says, well, we have no obligations. Israel is the occupying power. On that point, um, Egypt is partially right. Its obligations differ from that of Israel. Israel is the occupying power. It controls movement between, for example, Gaza and the West Bank. So even if a, a Palestinian Gaza leaves from Gaza via Cairo, flies to Amman and tries to cross, they still face an Israeli border agent. So the obligations do differ. Um, and Egypt does generally, under international law, have a prerogative over who can enter and exit its borders. But Israel, uh, Egypt is also obligated under the Fourth Geneva Convention to ensure that its humanitarian provisions are adhered to. And its restrictions um, on Egypt contribute, exacerbate Israel's closure policy. So they are, in effect, often complicit in the really serious abuses to the rights of Palestinians living there. The other security justification that Egypt will use as well as the security situation um, in Sinai, and that justifies these restrictions. But let's be critically, uh, crystal clear. These restrictions, the shift really dates back to the military coup in 2013. It doesn't date back to, you know, when events in Sinai um, became more escalated in, in more recent years. Um, and the reality here is the way that Egypt, Egypt's policy operates, the kind of blanket sealing of its borders doesn't reflect a case by case security assessment. It's a sort of blanket um, you know, policy. So let me um, you know, maybe just conclude here um, by saying that I think this analysis is quite important. I think there is a linkage, and we can talk about this more in discussion. I think Egypt sees its role in Gaza, especially its mediation role around conflicts, as its ticket to continued um, good relations with the United States, uh, to good relations with the world, um, in essence, making itself useful to justify the ongoing military aid and fuel its own repression. So I think it's critical that we see the way in which the two repressions are linked, the way that Egypt is complicit in the open air prison that is Gaza. It isn't, in effect, complicit in Israel's apartheid policy towards Gaza. And while it sometimes does play a role in negotiating ceasefires, you know, the answer here is not to focus on the latest cycle of violence, but to look at the root causes. And the root causes, a core part of it, is the closure policy, is the apartheid that's being practiced. And Egypt plays a role in that, and it's critical that that's understood, appreciated, and I look forward to continuing the discussion after hearing from Raad. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, Raad, next up. <clears throat> Thank you, Ted. Uh, thank you, Yasmin and uh, Omar, um, for your very uh, in-depth uh, analysis and insight 
Uh, as Ted mentioned, my name is Raed Jabbar. Uh, I work with Dawn, uh, which is an organization uh, that was founded by Jamal Khashoggi before his murder by Saudi agents uh, in 2018. And <clears throat> I, I want to add a few things to what uh, uh, Omar and Yasmin said earlier. Uh, the first one is that we are facing a wave of um, what I have seen um, called uh, Gaza washing of the Sisi regime, uh, the Gaza washing, which is uh, introducing the Sisi regime as a as a peacemaker in the region uh, that should be um, congratulated congratulated for its efforts uh, to secure a ceasefire most recently, and that is becoming the central piece of communications between the Biden administration and the CC government, which is really shocking because the Biden administration and President Biden himself promised to hold CC accountable. He promised, like in, during the campaign trail uh, on social media, in very clear statements, he mocked, mocked a CC, called him Trump's favorite dictator, uh, and he said that he's going to change the US policy. Uh, from the business as usual to support uh, the CC regime with um, $1.3 billion a year and with unlimited political support to a new policy. So unfortunately, this debate has shifted now to uh, talking about CC as some sort of a, a peacemaker hero in the region who helped uh, end what uh, DC calls a war between um, Israel and Palestinian factions in, in, in Gaza. That's absurd for so many reasons. Uh, on the one hand, as uh, both Omar and Yasmin pointed out, the Sisi government is complicit in Israel's crimes. This is an Israeli crime. Israel is the occupying force. Uh, is, Israel is occupying Gaza. Egypt is not occupying Gaza. Uh, so this is obviously an Israeli crime of blockade um, that has been going on for 14 years now. Egypt is complicit in this crime. It supports the Israeli crime on a daily basis. Um, the Egyptian government and Sisi regime are, are not heroes. They're not this, um, you know, um, peacemaking uh, force in the region. Uh, they're actually a part of the problem when it comes to the situation in Israel Palestine. I don't think Palestinians view CC as a hero or ally. Um, the fact that the US government continues to refuse to speak directly to Palestinian factions and groups in Gaza and needs to speak with them through uh, uh, the Egyptian government doesn't make the Egyptian government a hero at all. So I mean, that's like one track of it. The other track is the massive violations committed by the CC government inside Egypt. Um, the State Department's own report describing the human rights abuses of the CC government in Egypt is horrific. I, I mean, you would think that Dawn or Human Rights Watch or one of our organizations had actually written the scathing criticism of the Egyptian government uh, in the US government's own reports, the State Department's own annual human rights report, bashes all of the violations of the CC government, whether it's extrajudicial killings, prolonged detention with no access to attorneys, miserable situation for um, political prisoners, uh, really unprecedented in the region, um, enforced disappearances on a mass scale gross violations of human rights. But at the same time, the U.S. government continues to support the CC government with absolutely no checks and balances, no accountability, despite the fact that these, that the U.S. support is actually um, a breach of our own laws in the U.S. It's against the U.S. own laws to be supporting a government that is um, abusing human rights of its own citizens, like what CC is doing. 
uh, and Congress has mandated that uh, the government should suspend at least a part of the U.S. military aid to Egypt because of the abuses. And every single year, the U.S. government comes back to say, we're going to use a national security waiver to continue giving the Egyptian government money. So this is what the U.S. government has been saying. They're, say they're telling us, yes, it's true that CC is a human rights abuser. It's true that he's committing gross violations of human rights. It is true that the CC government is implicated in extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances and awful violations on a daily basis. We know that, but we can continue to support them. That's what they're saying publicly, officially, because they're saying this is within the U.S. national security interest. It's awful, and I think for everyone in the United States, we have to be outraged that our government continues to support these violations, these violations that happen in Egypt uh, and the embargo that continues to um, be implemented in Gaza are not happening out there by some dictator. They're happening in Egypt with our tax dollars. And I think everyone on the call in the U.S. should consider calling Congress, more importantly, calling the State Department. The State Department has its own uh, public comment line now for the first time in a while. So it's a good opportunity to actually take them up on their offer and call and say that you call on the State Department to refrain from issuing another national security waiver for Egypt's aid this year. Uh, they're considering the decision now. Uh, from what I know, um, they will make the decision in, in, in August and they're leaning towards issuing another national security waiver. All of our organizations here have been asking the State Department to refrain from doing that. Uh, before, before I stop talking, Ted, I want to say that the case of Rami Shah is, is actually an emblematic case to what we're talking about today. Uh, Rami Shah is a Palestinian Egyptian activist. Uh, he uh, is a political activist who dedicated his life to promote a better future for Egyptians and to promote a better future for Palestinians. And um, he advocated for better conditions in Egypt, especially after the uh, military coup uh, that, you know, we're, today is July 1st, so it's, uh, it's the anniversary of the, um, the military coup in Egypt. He dedicated his life to criticizing the military coup and asking for uh, better democratic reforms in Egypt. But at the same time, he dedicated his life to working on the BDS movement. Uh, as Ted mentioned, BDS stands for boycott sanctions and uh, or, or, or boycott divestment and sanctions against Israel, a, a similar movement to that in South Africa. So the fact that Rami Shaat has been in prison for two years now, he just celebrated his second birthday in prison last week. Um, this is an emblematic case to the Egyptian government and Sisi regime's oppression um, and human rights abuses against Palestinians and Egyptians. And I think that is the other thing that I want to invite everyone on the call to do in addition to picking up the phone today and calling the, the State Department, is to go to um, Rami Shat or freeramishat.com, which is the website, uh, and sign the petition and take action and keep Rami Shah uh, uh, on your radar uh, to speak with your members of Congress, to uh, send messages to the White House, uh, to continue to uh, uh, carry his legacy for calling for a better future for Egypt and for Palestinians. I will stop you, Ted. Thank you very much, and thank you for um, especially for uh, focusing on, on the Rami Shah case. Um, I have one question for you all um, before maybe we, you, you, you all want to um, respond or have a conversation and then we go on to questions from the audience. And um, you've all been observing this situation, Gaza, Egypt, human rights um, in the United States for some time. And I'm wondering if you could comment on um, efforts in Congress, Senate and, and, and the House of Representatives to um, push back, in particular, on the, I think on the on the on the um, Egypt front and the and the aid front, it has seemed to me that there's been more of that than there has in the past. But I wonder if you could um, say something about it in any in any order you want. 
Yeah, good I, is the expert. So I, I can start. <laughs> I'm, I'm based in DC, so that makes me an expert uh, just by <laughs> proximity to um, to what goes on here. But uh, but I, I will start with engagement uh, in the Middle East at large, really. Whether it is uh, the ongoing blind support to Israel with 3.1 3.8 billion dollars uh, a year, or whether it is the blind support to um, to Egypt with the 1.3 billion dollars. There is a movement to ask for more accountability. Like a good example is um, last year, Congress is inching closer to um, dissolving this issue of the national security waiver. So, um, for uh, for example, for next year's budget, the State Department will not be able, for the first time in the uh, U.S. Uh, Egyptian history uh, relationship of, of uh, U.S. and Egypt, uh, uh, the State Department will not be able to issue a national security waiver for the entirety of the funds. So some funds are being taken outside of the national security waiver um, umbrella. So uh, we will be seeing for the first time ever some actual cuts to U.S. military aid uh, to Egypt. I personally think that the U.S. should suspend or cut all of the U.S. military aid to Egypt, 100%. Uh, we should not be contributing to uh, violations and human rights abuses for a dictatorship that came to power uh, on the on the back of a tank. We shouldn't. And that's it. That's the end of the story. Um, but the way that Congress moves is much slower, and there are additional restrictions added here and there. Uh, there is some language added to uh, must pass bills uh, in Congress, uh, demanding more accountability, restricting more funds. Uh, I saw a few very strong congressional letters going from the Senate and House side um, asking the State Department, asking the Egyptian government about the fate of political prisoners, tens of thousands of them, as uh, Yasmin mentioned, up to 60,000 political prisoners there. Um, and we also saw the formation of a new caucus, the uh, Egypt caucus, uh, led by Congressman uh, Milanowski in the House side to try to focus on uh, the abuses of uh, of the Egyptian government. I would say from our perspective as, a, as the organization that was founded by Jamal Khashoggi, we are completely shocked by the news indicating that the CC government also played a role um, in the actual murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And that has not be, been made public with all of the details yet. So we're learning very, very slowly that the airplane that flew to Istanbul from um, Saudi Arabia to, with, the, with the team that killed Jamal Khashoggi, assassinated him in the consulate, that that airplane made a stop in Cairo and, and picked up the poison uh, that was injected into, in Jamal Khashoggi's arm a few hours later. So the CC government is implicit in the um, premeditated murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And this was not released by, the information was not released in full by the U.S. government yet. Uh, members of Congress are extremely furious about this. There is movement now to request additional reporting language, and ad additional restrictions and sanctions on the CC government because of their role with the Khashoggi murder. So there is definitely movement, uh, uh, not just within the human rights organizations, but within uh, Congress to rethink and reevaluate uh, the U.S. relationship with the CC regime. I'll just maybe add a word about the um, Israel-Palestine and some of the shifts in dynamics there. I think we've certainly seen that, and, and it sort of goes beyond, I think, just the, the squad or sort of the new group um, of, um, you know, Congress people, largely from the Democratic Party, that have been making sort of connections between the treatment of Palestinians and other racial justice and social justice issues. I really do think the conversation that took place during uh, the escalation in May in the U.S. Congress um, um, you know, with a wide variety of Congress people, started raising questions around U.S. aid, including U.S. aid that goes to, um, you know, the Israeli government. Um, you know, there was a number of Congress people who used the term, you know, apartheid to refer to Israel's treatment of Palestinians. Um, and you saw not just that, but even, you know, Congress people who were more historically sympathetic, um, you know, with the Israeli government that had long sort of, um, you know, 
ensured that um, this was a bipartisan issue that were critical um, you know, of the Israeli government's conduct. There was more conversation around root causes, not just sort of a, a tunnel vision on the kind of latest round of, of escalation. So I do think there's starting to be shifts uh, that took place. Um, of course, there's now an effort with a new Israeli government and a new U.S. government to try and make bipartisanship uh, to return to the way it was. But I think, um, you know, that, that ship has sailed. Um, you know, the rift is not about particular politicians. It's about more and more people not accepting the status quo of apartheid and persecution, you know, for Palestinians. And certainly, uh, you know, the situation in Gaza, uh, you know, in many ways is, is, is one of the harsh manifestations of that policy. So I do think there's a rhetorical shift. I do think there's more pressure within the party. I think the Biden administration is being called out um, for its positions, including um, its its support of Israel during the latest um, you know, escalation or hostility. So I think there is movement, there is traction, but obviously there's a long way you know, to go on this issue. Um, <clears throat> if I can add one uh, final thing, thanks to Omar and thanks to Ra, they provide uh, really great coverage of this. But I would say that yes, efforts by uh, representatives like the squad or like Milanowski and others are, are, are derived from their commitment to human rights their agendas that commit that is committed to human rights and then that goes to the american citizens who are who went and voted for those representatives who want a congress that represents and that is committed to international human rights principles so if only american people could vote more for representatives who are committed to human rights there could be a future real shift within the american foreign policy in regards to palestine to egypt and to israel military aid uh, just a point that i wanted to to highlight here yeah thank you so much i think it's important um for people to to realize as they think about the situation in egypt which is horrific um since I got involved in this committee, I'm reading about, you know, <laughs> reports of things that are going on, and it's it, it it's it's awful to to be reading about every day. Um, and of course, the Gaza situation was a, an atrocity. There is, on the other hand, I think an opening of the sort that, that we haven't seen before, and I think we can, you know, take heart that there's a possibility by our efforts if we redouble them and and uh, and work very hard that we can make some progress which perhaps was not um, as possible um, in the past um, my uh, my comrades on the, on the on the US committee are um, messaging me and they wanted to remind us that the anniversary of the coup is July 3rd and not not today we wanted to actually um, do do this event. Uh, on July 3rd, but unfortunately, um, we thought that people would be all, all at the beach and are at least in the United States. So um, we, we got as close as, as we could. Um, did did you all um, have any response to each other um, on any other on any of the topics that anyone um, uh, brought up? Any con any further conversation between the three of you? I, I won't say like I, I'm a big fan of uh, Omar's work, um, especially with the most recent uh, apartheid uh, report that came uh, about um, about Israel. Uh, it has been definitely uh, a report sh that shifted the narrative about the region um, and about the U.S. relationships with Israel. Uh, and uh, the U.S. relationship with Israel has very, very big implications on the U.S. relationship with Egypt as well. So yeah, I mean, I just want to like congratulate Omar and Himarat Spot for uh, for playing an important role in moving the needle um, in in this like gridlocked conversation about the Middle East. Um, and like you know, we used to be stuck in this conversations about the only democracy in the in the in the region, and we have to support them with giving money to Jordan and Egypt. And now this has actually shifted the conversation to why are we? spending billions of dollars, $1.3 billion for Egypt, $1.5 billion to, to Jordan, by the way. So as of uh, this fiscal year, uh, and, and $3.8 billion to, to Israel. Why? Like, well, this is an actual question, like from a US perspective, why are we spending all of this money to maintain an apartheid regime that is abusing human rights? Uh, why are we subsidizing that? So I mean, I would, I would just like say this, 
this is this is like a development that happened the last uh, few months that had really shifted the narrative in DC. Maybe I'll just add, uh, thanking Raj for that. And of course, Human Rights Watch is not the first, you know, organization to conclu- make a conclusion about apartheid. Palestinian organizations for years or even decades have been using the term and, uh, you know, uh, too many of the world didn't listen, you know, and, and recently we've seen the term used by Israeli human rights groups, academics, scholars, activists of all, all, all. But one thing I was struck listening to Yasmin's presentation, I covered Egypt for Human Rights Watch in 2013, 2014, um, along with uh, with colleagues. I, I wrote Human Rights Watch's report on the Rabah massacre, you know, one of the largest single day killings of protesters in modern Egyptian history. And we were you know, uh, I think all of us in various ways can't go back to Egypt. But I'm just struck hearing this kind of detailed recitation of what's happening, you know, just how much impunity for these abuses um, has sort of, um, you know, uh, green lighted these abuses. I think many of us warned uh, with Rabaa, you know, in our report, we called for, I mean, we named CC, we named others and their direct role in the killings. And we said that it's critical that they're investigated and prosecuted because if the message that the Egyptian government gets is a green light is is not you know a sanction the government this wasn't like a you know random killing of it was a planned killing the report lists the evidence of government meetings where they weighed uh, evidence of potential you know, numbers of civilians that would be killed, and they proceeded to proceed with what they knew would be. In fact, they they bragged that this was less bloody than they envisioned—a killing in which hundreds, if not um, you know, if not uh, over a thousand, were killed in the span of 12 hours. And really, the point I want to make there is the because the international community did not. Um, impose consequences on the perpetrators and on the Egyptian government. That was really the green light for, in many ways, I think, for the abuses that Yasmin, you know, laid out. And by the way, it's the same story uh, when it comes to Israel Palestine, right? I mean, the fact that the Israeli um, authorities have not been held accountable for for their serious abuses, for crimes against humanity, for war crimes, um, has been the green light to continue with similar cycles of bloodshed and repression. So I just that was sort of a reflection I had listening to Yasmin's comment. I mean, again, I don't follow Egypt every day like I used to because my my job has been now to focus on Israel Palestine. But you know, it, it's it's really stark to hear that reality and also sort of mentioning the State Department's reports now also highlighting these abuses. Yasmin, uh, anything to add? Well, thank you, Omar, and thank you, Ro'ed. And uh, just to, 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 to let you know the, what the, the violations that I spoke of today are just, uh, are not even 1% of what's going on currently in Egypt with, with it absolute impunity and also in the dark not everything is being covered legislations are being issued to make it harder and harder for people to speak out to for for lawyers to bring news from the uh, 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 closed courtrooms where where detainees are denied access to legal counsel or due process and other rights not only that but banning websites and news outlets has contributed to the dark shell over egypt nobody really knows what's going on in the world and they cannot mobilize lacking the, the important news that they need to know and no other than Egyptians in exile and activists in exile, Egyptians on the ground who works when, within civil society are, are always followed by cases, by travel bans, by other obstacles in their ways that makes communication to the international community even harder. Lots of my work is with the UN and with the UN working groups on submissions and cases. So lots of the lawyers in Egypt cannot communicate with the UN in fear of being uh, 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 punished by by legislations like the counterterrorism law or the terrorism versus under the penal code that makes every act every email every message is a crime that could lead to indefinite imprisonment so yes this is all a part of the reality and i think that egyptians on the ground needs our solidarity badly and today thank you so much um we're going to go to questions that have come up um in the comments um some people have two questions and um 
I will come back if there's time. Uh, if you've asked to to, to your second um, to your second question, but we'll um, we'll we'll just do uh, one each for the time being. So uh, someone named Virgo S one. Of course, these are you know pseudonyms or or, te or uh, uh, tags. Uh, asks what if any support have you received from the UN and any international agencies? And I think Rod wanted to start, but and and I think you asked me you. Yeah, I actually wanted to answer the second question from Virgo Esquan, which is, have any of us been detained, interrogated, or banned Sorry. from travel? Sorry, yeah, okay. Have any uh, of you been detained? <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the above. Uh, but um, I want to say that I, uh, I, uh, I was banned from uh, uh, going to the West Bank. I am a Palestinian American myself. And I went there a few times on work trips, uh, but then uh, three years ago, I was banned from entering uh, to go to Janine after my father passed away. Uh, and uh, if people are interested in reading the story, I, I wrote uh, an in-depth um, op-ed for the New York Times. Um, I think the title was, um, Why Wouldn't Israel... Uh, let me check. Why, why Wouldn't Israel Let Me Ban... Let Me... Yeah, Why Won't... Israel let me mourn my father is the name of the op-ed. So I, I, um, I talk about what, how I was banned for political reasons uh, based on the uh, B, uh, anti BDS laws uh, because I worked with uh, an organization at the time that advocated for upholding international law uh, with US inter inter interactions with Israel. Uh, so that's like, um, you know, and I know that other, other folks on the, on the panel have also have um, experiences that, that are similar. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I uh, both the countries we're talking about have, uh, you know, forced me out or banned me entry. So I was um, um, basically forced out of Egypt ahead of the release of our Rabah report in 2014. And two of my colleagues were denied entry and turned around the airport. At the time I was in country, I had to leave haven't gone back since. And actually, Human Rights Watch hasn't had access um, to Egypt, um, you know, since. Our, our team that covers Egypt does it, you know, from the outside um, in large part. And uh, as, as some of you may know, I was deported by the Israeli government from uh, Israel-Palestine late 2019 um, uh, over a claim that I support BDS, as you, as you <laughs> identified earlier, boycott, divestment, sanctions. Uh, much of the case was... Um, originally built around my activism as a college student years ago. Um, and then in, as it, we challenged it in court, I went up to the Israeli Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld the decision focusing on Human Rights Watch's work in large part, which in, in, it in essence said amounts, our work on businesses and settlements amounts to, in their opinion, a, a boycott call, even though Human Rights Watch actually takes no position on BDS. We document rights abuses and call for them to end, including by companies, but not for action by consumers. Um, to the other part of the question, I would just add by saying, um, and I, I should have, I've also been uh, denied a visa after living in Syria back in uh, before 2011 and in Bahrain as well and uh, for my work in Human Rights Watch. Um, but in terms of the first question about uh, UN agencies, I think part of the shift we've seen in the conversation around Israel-Palestine um, has been, um, you know, an embrace by more and more of the apartheid analysis. So the former UN Secretary General two days ago issued uh, you know, an op-ed. Certainly we've seen special uh, procedures at the UN use the term apartheid. Michael Link, um, the, the special rapporteur for the OPT, has issued some quite strong um, you know, statements. I know Egypt um, has been a bit more challenging in some of these bodies, in part because Egypt uses some of the same bullying tactics as the Israeli government when it comes to UN bodies. But um, we're starting to see a shift, at least on the Israel-Palestine side of things. Thank you, Omar. On the first question also about the UN, uh, I've been seeing the same shift that Omar uh, uh, highlighted because we've been seeing more resolution being, resolutions being issued by UN bodies that identify certain practices in Egypt, which is a good move uh, forward, a good step forward in identifying those practices under international law. However, Egypt is trying to avoid all international uh, uh, accountability mechanisms uh, by trying to amend its leg legislations to further protect its officials against uh, accountability uh, for crimes they are uh, they are committing, such as the recent amendment that should be out any day now on the constitutional court law that 
allows the Egyptian domestic constitutional court to have jurisdiction over international uh, courts, tribunals, bodies, decisions, and give it the right to deny uh, 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 the execution of these uh, decisions. And on the next, the other question, have I ever been detained or banned from tra traveling? We all know that Egyptian human rights lawyers have been facing a major crackdown, being going to prisons, being threatened, even being arrested from uh, prosecution offices while they are working, like my dear friend, uh, lawyer Mohammed al-Baqir and other. I was uh, luckier than uh, the recents of my friends, the, re the rest of my friends and colleagues in 2017, I had, I defended, in 2014, I defended a child uh, who was arbitrarily detained uh, and arbitrarily uh, uh, spent nine months in prison in uh, an adult facility instead of juvenile facility with uh, ISIS extremists. He was recruited and when he went out of prison, uh, he bombed himself into a church. So uh, huge media campaigns, uh, pro-state lawyers have filed complaints against me, accusing me of inciting the bombing uh, because I did my work and I, uh, I got this child out. And I, when, I, when I gave out statements about extremism and radicalizations in prison, I faced major threats. Uh, my law firm was vandalized and I was never able to practice law again in Egypt. That's when I moved to the United States. Um, but this is not as far as spending years in indefinite uh, detentions, detention or uh, uh, um, being unable to travel and to, to protect your families. Even dissidents of outside of Egypt are living in fear for their families because they could, f they could face reprisals due to their activism out of, outside of Egypt. No one is safe. But I don't think, uh, I don't blame anybody for silence, but I don't think we can remain silent in facing all of this. Uh, thank you all. Um, that was a great question. Uh, I'd like to add that when we organize these events, um, we cannot get, and probably it's irresponsible for us to even ask anyone in Egypt to speak <laughs> at, at, such a, at such an event about human rights violations in Egypt. And as, as Yasmin just said, um, many are afraid, even if they're outside, to talk at such fora because th they're under threat of their relatives being punished um, for what they say, even while they're outside. So, so I mean, the, just, just to realize that the stakes are serious and that the U.S. aid that goes to Egypt supports the suppression of free speech about Egypt inside the United States by people who live in the United States and are U.S. citizens happen to have Egyptian relatives. So um, another question from Elliot Kola, who is a member of our committee. Um, isn't U.S. aid to countries conditioned on minimum human rights standards? If so, why are these conditions waived for CC's regime? Uh, I can say something about this that I just learned recently because I have few to do with uh, uh, with advocacy and policy, but we know that there is a security waiver of on on the aid. So it's not all uh, uh, related to human to protecting human rights and commit being committed to human rights. But Egypt could claim that all these measures are done under huge uh, uh, national security threats, and that's why we can't be fully committed to a human rights agenda. I think Ra, it could say more on this and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, you are right, and I, I did touch on that a little bit earlier, uh, on how uh, the United States recognizes all of the violations by the Egyptian regime, but continues to uh, grant the Sisi government uh, a national security waiver. Um, this is um, a shameful policy that has been um, followed over and over and over, and we are hoping to end it in the upcoming months and years. And just to say, when it comes to U.S. Um, 
aid to, you know, to Israel, um, you know, that has obviously been carefully sort of safeguarded um, in, in legislation. There is an effort now with, um, led by Betty McCollum, and again, I think I could say more about these efforts to uh, prohibit uh, USAP for being used for certain uh, purposes. But of course, that, you know, remains an initiative that, um, you know, it's building support, but nowhere near the legislation phase. So there's been talk about conditionality, uh, you know, if they not using it for certain purposes, that sort of emerged in the past. But, you know, we're, we're, we're talking sort of about smaller initiatives, that, uh, you know, or, or things that are, you know, limiting its use in certain areas, but aren't actually conditioning the whole package. Human Rights Watch recommended in our recent report that uh, all aid, uh, all military arms sales and security assistance be conditioned on the Israeli government ending apartheid persecution, taking steps to end it, which they're not doing. Well, I can say uh, a little bit about that, Ted, and maybe also touch on a question that came from uh, Pam Mayers. Uh, can, I, can I do both? You're muted, Ted. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, let me just read the question, and then we can, um, yeah. and other people can uh, uh, answer it as well. Uh, Pam Myers asked, please clarify exactly how much the U.S. is currently giving Palestine, but I guess by by meaning the the Palestine Authority. That's that's actually what, like an important part of the answer is <laughs> defining what Palestine means. Um, but first, let me touch on what Omar was saying, which is the United States uh, aid to Israel. So that is um, a part of an an MOU that was signed between the Obama administration and the Israeli government with Netanyahu. Uh, and that MOU was encoded in U.S. law a couple of years ago. It was uh, encoded in the National Defense Authorization Act. So the amount of how much the U.S. gives Israel is actually a part of the U.S. law, at least until 20, uh, uh, 28. Uh, but, uh, as Amr mentioned, how this money can be spent, the restrictions on how the money will be spent, um, there are so many regulations, existing laws in the U.S., so the Foreign Assistance Act and uh, many of its amendments, um, you know, the Arms Export Control Act and many of its amendments, they have, uh, they spell out restrictions on how the money can be spent. So even if Israel is guaranteed to receive $3.8 billion a year, um, $3.3 .3 billion go through the State Department uh, and uh, $500 million go through the Defense Department. So even if they're guaranteed the money, it doesn't mean that they can spend it on whatever, like to um, break international law, violate human rights. They can't. So there are restrictions. Some restrictions are encoded in U.S. law. We're trying to push the U.S. government to implement them and stop circumventing U.S. law for U.S. for, for political considerations. Some of them are, uh, we're trying to even improve them through legislation, like the one that was introduced by Chairwoman McCollum, 2590 is the most recent iteration of that, and it's uh, it's a space to you know to talk about that and, and organize around it. Um, and the bigger message there is that um, we're not just talking about condemning Israeli violations or Palestinian violations, or whatever. We're not talking about like telling other people what to do only. We're, st we're 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 talking about what we should be doing with our money. That's like one step removed from the situation Israel-Palestine proper, it's a question, it's a U.S. question, it's not an Israeli question, it's not a Palestinian question, it's a U.S. question. What should we be doing with tax dollars money? Should we be subsidizing these kind of um, activities there? And the, the, the answer to that question is, is no, we should not be uh, subsidizing human rights violations, and this is becoming more and more popular in Washington, D.C. I want to touch on, on uh, Pam um, Meyer's email, uh, question about you know, how much the U.S. gives, quote-unquote, Palestine? That's a, that's a loaded question. Like, I think um, it depends on what, what you mean by Palestine. If you, if you mean how much the U.S. gives for um, humanitarian aid, for example, to the uh, to UNRWA, the U.N. agency uh, responsible for aiding Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, and the, some parts of the Middle East, uh, the U.S. historically gave a few hundreds of millions of dollars every year, uh, they cut that funding during the Trump administration, and it is restarting again. If you mean what the U.S. gives to the Palestinian Authority, the U.S. gives the Palestinian Authority tens of millions of dollars in security assistance, and 
I think the U.S. should also cut that money. So I don't want anyone on the call to think that we are saying cut money from the from the Israeli government, but continue to give money to the Palestinian Authority. You know, because <laughs> we're like taking sides. You know, the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government are a part of this bigger system of apartheid and and the oppression and giving money to the to the Palestinian Authority is not actually giving money to quote unquote Palestine. So I just want to clarify that. Like I think some people think that there are like two sides here and the US is maybe supporting you know one side against the other differently. The Palestinian Authority is on one high, one hand and the Israeli government on the, on the other. Um, the the political analysis of the situation on the ground and in DC is actually different. Supporting the Palestinian Authority, supporting the Israeli government, supporting the Egyptian uh, dictatorship, and even supporting the Jordanian government. These are all a part of one big integrated system uh, for uh, maintaining the status quo in the region. Anyone want to add anything to that? Okay, I'm going to um, next question um, from someone I'll call Maz because <laughs> that's that's what I can get. Um, isn't the um, increasing state of repression also a sign of a growing lack of legitimacy of the current Egyptian regime by society? Uh, well, we thought so. It should be, but since the Muslim Brotherhood used the same uh, uh, argument uh, after the military coup uh, and after the demonizing of this movement of the Muslim Brotherhood and every uh, to, to everybody who supports them, all these claims has become uh, uh, stigmatized by 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 denying the Egyptian state and denying uh, legitimacy or legitimacy of the current uh, uh, government. So I don't think Egyptian uh, used the, the legitimate, legitimacy uh, 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 argument, but we would say that any country that violates its uh, citizens' human rights to the, to the level of having tens of thousands in prison, to the level that this, the government need to build new prisons every each year instead of building uh, uh, hospitals or, 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 or schools to maintain stability and to maintain function and to, to, to fabricate charges, to, to, to create an arsenal of, of legislations to support this. This all uh, questions the, the legitimacy of a state. However, is this uh, what the international com international law identify as, uh, as, as as something that hurts the legitimacy or, or denies legitimacy? No. So we are we are having a tight space to call on legitimacy here, but we can call on crimes under international law. We can always call on uh, uh, arbitrary practices that is identified under UN mechanisms that Egypt is uh, a state. Uh, member in and use and drive on those arguments because they are easier to prove and this is just the 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 the, the, the law talks I, I don't know uh, if Raida Namar has uh, any other additions to this okay we'll go uh, we'll go into the next question this is from Niv um, do you feel like your work has been gradually becoming more accepted in the mainstream? Maybe I can answer that about Israel-Palestine and Gaza more generally, and then maybe uh, the others. I think, you know, I, I sort of alluded to it. I mean, I don't know if it's our, maybe our work as a collective, the human rights movement. I do think um, there is a shift, you know, you know, in the Israel-Palestine conversation. I mean, take the term apartheid. I mean, you know, this for was, you know, sort of outside of what was considered a mainstream concept. It was sort of reserved to maybe academics, but even then sort of the fringes of academia or a term used by Palestinians, you know, and not one that's part of the conversation. And I think we've seen a, a shift and that's a big part of it is due to the number of human rights groups that have started using the term, you know, over the years. So in the last few months, we've seen it not only embraced by Israeli, Palestinian, you know, four Israeli human rights groups, most Palestinian civil society groups, international human rights groups. We've seen it echoed even 
progressive mainstream Jewish groups in the United States who've been grappling with the term uh, and the use of it. We've seen legal scholars, you know, on both sides of, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S. and Europe um, and elsewhere, commentators um, who have used this term, you know, MSNBC commentators and mainstream pundits um, sort of grappling with it. You've seen even pop culture, uh, you know, icons, uh, parliamentarians you know, U.S. Congress people, parliamentarians in a different part of the world, two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa who used the term um, uh, to refer to the treatment of Palestinians. And you have countries, right? You have South Africa and Namibia themselves who held an event at the U.N. where they endorsed the analysis called for the world to reactivate the mechanisms used with apartheid that they faced. Um, the foreign ministers of Luxembourg and France um, in recent years, who have made reference, um, you know, to apartheid, the former Secretary General of the UN. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, but I think that's a sign that the paradigm is shifting. It's not just the work of human rights groups; it's mostly shifting because the reality on the ground. It's become impossible not to call a spade a spade, you know, to call a thing by its name. Um, but I do think there's been a shift there. And I think um, the recent escalation in Gaza was a part of that in terms of, it was evidence of that. Um, but I'll let Yasmin and, and maybe Rod say more either on the Palestine-Israel piece or on the Egypt piece. I just want to say that, like, I, I totally agree with Omar, and, but I, I think, I mean, to answer the, the spirit of the question, like, it's not about the mainstream accepting uh, uh, like the movement's work. It's it's more about the mainstreams. <clears throat> it's becoming it's becoming more difficult for the mainstream media and mainstream politicians to ignore it. You know, Omar said that the word apartheid has been used for decades by Palestinians, by even Israeli Jewish activists, um, by South Africa. You know, uh, like I, I've heard the word apartheid hundreds of times uh, growing up. But it was ignored, and now it is very difficult to ignore it. Uh, so I think that is the, the actual shift. Yasmin? Um, maybe well, uh, I agree with what Omar and Ra'id said, but in, in the Egyptian case, I feel that Egypt is already in the mainstream as a human rights violator. It's, it's in everywhere, it's already a fact. However, some, some uh, uh, bodies, some opinions, have viewed that human rights violation comes uh, 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 on, uh, uh, with the benefit that Egypt is growing economically, that the CC is doing uh, an economic uh, uh, advances in, uh, and, and rebuilding the country. And I don't think that this is true, but this could go with it. We could uh, discuss this in another panel. But I would say that Egypt is already uh, uh, known for human rights violation. However, the strange thing that this is still acceptable by the international community, that this is something that we can go with and keep updating without doing anything about it and knowing that every all of our efforts would not work without uh, um, strong other countries, stronger allies with Egypt. Uh, taking a stand. I have a question. Um, it's not in the chat, but uh, somebody texted it to me, and it's specifically for Yasmin, uh, but I think it's a good one. Um, could you explain the recent um, really incredibly long jail terms for the, the women that um, were uh, uh, posting on TikTok um, and, 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 and um, talk about how wide this kind of uh, or how it shows how wide the repression is um, in, in Egypt. Um, I think it kind of stunned people that's, that, that that's these... That's a really, really good question, because when we say that it's not political activists, it's not just uh, uh, human rights defenders who are being targeted by the human, by the Egyptian authorities, no, everybody under on the Egyptian land could go to prison for doing something. So recently, Egypt has leg uh, created a issued a legislation on cyber crime uh, crimes, cy cyber crimes law, and uh, this uh, we we thought that this law would be used against uh, people who speaks of politics on Facebook or so. However, because we know that women are in Egypt are are uh, discriminated badly. They are facing sexual harassment every day. They are facing rape every day. And uh, the, the legal scope, the Egyptian legal scope cannot really 
uh, uh, hold men accountable for these crimes or even have good tools or mechanism to investigate such crimes. So uh, uh, we see that women fall victims before men. And that's what happened in the case uh, of TikTok. Uh, closer to COVID, when people started to explore the virtual spaces and using TikTok more, uh, people have noticed that there is another world. Uh, uh, women are expressing themselves freely outside of the misogyny and the, 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 the authority, authority of the family and the, the, of the conservative society. However, because the, the, now the public prosecution is part of the social media, they are there, they have an eye, and they observe, observe every post and every trend. When these women were trending, because everybody was uh, using TikTok more, some other TikTokers, video bloggers who are men, pointed out that this is not what we want our women to behave or we want our girls to express themselves. Um, how dare you to dance and express yourself while I'm doing the same thing? So the prosecution presenting itself as the moral guardian of to the people trying to win the, the public uh, ground by viewing itself as the protector of everything. So arresting these women after too many uh, calls by the, the conservative and the misogynist society led to imprisoning them. However, somehow there has been a wide solidarity movement by feminist uh, movements in Egypt and these women were acquitted especially Hanin uh, Hussein, who, who got the highest sentence of 10 years uh, uh, in prison, she was acquitted, but the prosecution somehow insisted that this is not acceptable. So because we don't have any female representation at the, at the public prosecution, so we could only imagine that every man there is acting as a protector of the society on their own affiliation and views, these women placed in uh, a human trafficking for taking videos with uh, um, their nieces and their nephews, stuff like this, and for participating on another, another application called Likey, that where you ask others to join the application, and when you do that, you make money, something that is happening all over the world. Internet has been, been monetized all over the world, and that's not a crime. However, because a woman, a woman, did this, she has been viewed as inciting debauchery, he, doing human trafficking, and even uh, hurting family morals. Uh, no, we're not going to discuss the broad and vague terms of the laws. However, using the internet and using application that has an added, that has a description on it, like TikTok and Likey, does not uh, uh, um, is not considered a human traf human trafficking case. So this this case has has a lot of uh, um, uh, mistakes legal wise, and I'm sure that the Cassation Court was is going to reverse the sentence. However, this is an indication of how the how the judiciary has uh, a huge space to act based on their own affiliation. We don't have enough restrictions on the law over the judiciary and that also explained the high politicization within our judiciary. It makes sense that they would follow uh, the orders of the state security authority or, or any other uh, authority because it's not independent. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, I, we're not going to be able to get all the questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, Maybe, maybe a couple more, maybe only this one. Um, Allison asks, could the speakers address Egypt-Palestine solidarity? What currently exists and is there opportunity for regional international solidarity among rights activists, grassroots, civil society, uh, and so on? I have to say that part of our motivation as uh, people who are working on repression in Egypt is that we were very, were very interested in uh, linking up Egyptian repression to uh, you know what it's doing in Gaza and and, and the support for, for for Israel. So we're very interested in this subject. Um, 
If I may start, when I was in law school in Egypt, the only marshes that we were allowed to go out in was marshes for Gaza. Other than that, Mubarak authorities would throw us in jail. So historically, Egypt has been standing as Egyptian people, normal people, not even uh, politically affiliated people, have been in standing, standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people, going out in every occasion to refuse the, to deny the occupation, to refuse the occupation. However, this changed dem dramatically after enacting the anti-protest law, uh, uh, after after the, the, the military coup, and after creating other legislations that make every aspect of freedom of expression is impossible. Like people cannot, people who has posted on Palestine on, on social media has been faced questioning by state security authority, just posting on social media. So I know that I understand that the Egyptian people are under uh, extreme circumstances that does not allow them to show their solidarity, their solidarity. But I have seen statements by political parties that they are they they don't have a much space to work, but they have issued their standings from said their standings from what's going on in Palestine. I've seen a couple of virtual events uh, uh, um, uh, shared between uh, political Egyptian political parties and Palestinian uh, uh, bodies and entities. Um, it's at its minimum. However, all of the Egyptian solidarity has been threatened and uh, uh, um, stopped by practices that leads to every other uh, op oppressive oppressive measurement. I mean, I can add a little bit uh, if we still have time. Uh, I, mean, I, can, I mean, I I completely agree with Yasmin. The the solidarity between um, Egyptians and Palestinians is very very deep rooted. Um, a lot of it is uh, demographic, like the um, you know Egyptians and Palestinians literally speak the same language. You know, they overlap with the same religions. Um, geographically, they're very close. After Nakba uh, in 1948, many Palestinians um, took refuge in, in Egypt. So there, there is a big contingency of Palestinians uh, who are also Egyptian, who live in Egypt with um, Egyptian uh, ID cards uh, as Palestinian refugees uh, there in, in Egypt. Uh, when the 2011 revolution happened, um, Egyptians were chanting um, um, pro-Palestinian uh, chants as a part of their uh, chance for pro-Egyptian chance for, for a better future for both people. It's very intertwined. Uh, and uh, even now, although there is uh, extreme oppression uh, by the Sisi government uh, against any attempts to, um, to, to speak about the solidarity because of, because of El Sisi's strategic alliance with Israel, um, you can still tell that there is uh, uh, this solidarity happens on on a daily basis. Uh, just in the last uh, couple of months, we saw how Sisi um, was pandering to the Egyptian people by trying to score some points uh, with sending humanitarian aid to Gaza, putting a few um, Palestinian flags, changing the rhetoric about Gaza because he knows that talking about Palestine gets him points with the uh, with the Palestinian people. So I would say, like uh, Palestinians and Egyptians. Share, share, sh they share solidarity, and they share they share the same oppressors as well, uh, the same powers to be that who are behind the oppression of the Palestinian people are actually happen to be the same oppressors of the of the Egyptian people. Uh, the relationships are very very close. Uh, nothing will change it. It's a historic relationship. Whichever regime comes and goes, uh, I think the the link between the Egyptian and Palestinian people is is eternal. <laughs> No, I mean, I think Yasmin and Ra'ad put it really well. I would just add that, I mean, it um, definitely during the 2011 uh, revolution, you saw Palestinians inspired. Um, you definitely saw during the protests in Egypt, solidarity with Palestinians. So I think the history is well documented, well written. But I would add, and I think Ra'ad touched on this a little bit, the way that solidarity of the oppressing powers also works, right? And I'm not just talking about Israel and Egypt, which obviously, you know, are, are very closely coordinating, but actually the people. PA. The PA has become much more authoritarian uh, uh, in its treatment of Palestinians, so as Hamas authorities in Gaza. 
um, I'm competing with the prayer call behind me here in Amman. Um, but in many cases, the PA has followed the playbook of the cybercrime law. There's a cybercrime law the PA has, has put in place in the West Bank. And actually, um, you know, uh, even, for example, the, when, when Egypt accelerated its persecution of, of those that engaged or they accused of engaging in homosexual conduct. There was an uptick on the Palestinian side and worries that we would follow the kind of Egyptian path. So not only is there, I think, solidarity in, in the way that I and Yasmin talked about in terms of the popular mobilizations between peoples, and I think for many internationally, but there also is a, a way in which the oppressing authorities, not just Israel and Egypt, but also the Palestinian authorities, you know, are in alignment. And I do agree that um, there's a there's a sort of um, no matter and there are very clear efforts by the authorities to feed into fragmentation, right? To see Palestinians as pro-brotherhood and therefore anti, you know, Sisi, to, to, to see, you know, uh, Egypt as, you know, uh, the jailer of Gaza. But but I think people understand that these are government policies and they don't reflect the, the solidarity between um, the peoples. We just have a couple more minutes. Um, so I'm going to uh, take this occasion to uh, thank everyone who, who uh, raised questions. We had great questions. We had more than we could uh, answer, but hopefully uh, we'll be back again um, to go over some of these topics because it's not going away. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Please do follow uh, them and their work uh, at Human Rights Watch, um, Tahrir Institute, and um, Don. Um, please, especially if you're interested in uh, your U.S. citizen, interested in working on this subject, please do uh, follow us and maybe get in touch with us at the U.S. Committee to End Repression in Egypt. And uh, this has been uh, great. Um, thanks again, and thanks to Haymarket Books for making it possible. Um, yeah, and that's it. I think they're going to shut us off. <laughs> so.